Hey, good evening, everyone. Thanks so much for tuning in. Welcome to the Thrombosis Canada program, Thrombosis and COVID-19, Outpatient Management. My name is Matthew Nicholson. Last year, I had the very good fortune of training with the Thrombosis AFC program at McMaster University. And I'm currently working as a hematologist and thrombosis specialist in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. I will be co-facilitating tonight's program with Dr. Elena Castellucci. Dr. Castellucci, if you're there, why don't you give us a mic check and introduce yourself? Good evening, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here tonight, and thank you for joining this uh, webinar. Uh, I am a thrombosis physician and general internist in Ottawa, um, and uh, I'm really looking forward to all the questions that you guys will have tonight. We have a great program set up for you. There we go. Uh, so I did want to take a minute up top just to acknowledge the work of the entire planning committee, including co-chairs, Lena Castellucci and Peter Gross, as well as Vicky Tagalakis and Ryan Zarakinski, as well as our three fabulous presenters who we're going to be introducing individually just shortly. Before we begin, the system has automatically muted all of the participants except for the speakers. If you have a question, please use the chat function at the bottom of the screen. And that should allow you to answer, ask your questions throughout the presentation. Uh, myself and I will be monitoring things. We'll take a look and collate all those questions at the end of the three presentations so that we can facilitate questions and discussions at the, at the end. Over the past year, we've all been struggling with adapting clinical practice to a global pandemic. Our goal today is to bring you the most up-to-date information. Anticoagulation and COVID-19 and outpatient clinical practice has been an area of some activity recently, uh, particularly with the introduction of much more widespread vaccination. We're going to address some of the most important topics, topics that I get asked about every single day in clinic, including which patients uh, may be at risk, if at all, from vaccination and what we should be advising our patients uh, in those settings. I think that's the question that has been the very most common this week. I don't think I've seen any thrombosis patients who didn't have some questions about that after seeing it on the news. We're also gonna be talking about outpatient thrombosis primary prevention and what we can do about management of COVID-19 inside of long-term care facilities. On this slide are the disclosures of our presenters. I'm gonna leave this up for just a minute so you can take a look. While we have a second, I'll note that tonight's presentation is being recorded. It will be available online for those who couldn't catch it this evening or wanted to take a look back in the coming days. Tonight's program is supported by educational grants from Bayer, BMS Pfizer Canadian Alliance, Leo Pharma, and Pfizer Hospital. The agenda and faculty for this program was developed by the Scientific Steering Committee from Thrombosis Canada. All faculty have been directed that any recommendations involving clinical medicine are to be based on evidence that is accepted within the profession and that all scientific research referred to, reported, or used during the course of this CME slash CPD activity in support of justification of patient care recommendations conforms to the generally accepted standards. By way of a very brief introduction, I imagine it has not escaped anyone's notice that we are living in the midst of a global pandemic caused by a respiratory coronavirus. Both cases and deaths are highest in the United States with India, Brazil, and many other countries suffering massively under the burden of this pandemic. The mean incubation period for SARS-CoV-2 COVID-19 infection is approximately five days with a wide interval on either side. And that from the time of symptoms, viral shedding continues to increase for up to 10 days or even longer in the cases of severe infections. The tail for recovery of symptoms is also extremely long, uh, particularly in those with more severe infections. And we learn more over time about the consequences of COVID-19 infection, including long-term respiratory symptoms and thrombotic events. There are some well-established risk factors for both adverse outcomes and thrombotic events. These include older age, male sex, and cumulative cardiovascular risk factors. The unique pathophysiology cytokine release and the endothelial damage, which is directly caused by COVID-19 infection, seem to generate the perfect storm for the development of both arterial and venous thrombosis. This is a, an older study actually from pretty early on from French ICUs, where we can see that the rates of pulmonary embolism in COVID-19 patients in their intensive care unit with COVID-19 uh, was much higher than their general population in the ICU or a population from the previous year where they compared to those with influenza. 
Again, this unique pathology of COVID-19, the endothelial damage that comes along with it and the activation of thrombotic pathways seem to lead to higher rates of thrombosis than what we had seen in similar conditions in the past. We will go into a bit more detail in one of the presentations about some data on the rates of thrombosis in these and as well as other uh, populations with COVID-19. Again, at this point, the number one question I'm being asked in clinic is about vaccine safety. And so I'm very excited to introduce a presentation by Dr. Jeff Habert this evening, um, who's going to be able to hopefully help us out, give us the information that we need to answer these questions uh, in an informed fashion. We're also going to be talking about how current thromboprophylaxis strategies and guidelines influence the management of patients in long-term care and how we can deal with primary and secondary thromboprophylaxis for patients with COVID-19 in the outpatient setting. Our first speaker tonight is Dr. Jeff Habert. Uh, if, if he'll permit me, I'll give him a, a quick brief introduction here. Uh, Dr. Habert's a family physician in Thornhill where he's been working for the last 31 years. He's an assistant professor in the Department of Family and Community Medicine at the University of Toronto. He's also a peer assessor for the College of Physicians and Surgeons Ontario. He's also an investigating coroner for the City of Toronto and a peer leader in Ontario MD. He has an interest in the use of clinical practice guidelines and has participated in committees to establish guidelines in the fields of depression, stroke, and of course, thrombosis. I mean, he's in fact, the previous co-chair of our Thrombosis Canada, Canada Clinical Guides. He's also got a number of publications in all of the above areas. Dr. Habert is a national speaker in any number of arenas and actively participates in scientific committees involved in the creation of educational programs. Without further ado, Dr. Habert. Thank you so much, everybody. I was going to share my screen. So I was asked to give a talk about COVID-19 vaccine efficacy, safety. And, and at the beginning, we were talking, we wanted to talk about thrombosis safety. And we are going to talk about that. We're going to talk about Thrombosis Canada statements. But as I was doing the research to prepare this talk, I realized, as we all realize, that information is coming to us every five minutes. It's changing hourly. Um, my patients are often hearing about information before I do because they're hearing it from the press. So it's so disjointed. So I wanted to give you the research on what we do know, what's developing. I mean, things have transpired today that aren't even in this talk that we'll briefly mention, but we want to give you an overview of vaccine safety in, in patients on anticoagulation, but also patients that are not anticoagulated. So as of yesterday, we had uh, almost 950,000 cases in Canada with 22,000 deaths. But what's getting reassuring is it's a little bit better in the number of patients vaccinated in Canada. We're getting close to that 10%. So we're getting there. I mean, slowly, but getting there. Note Quebec. Quebec's doing really, really well. 11% um, uh, are vaccinated in Quebec. I want to introduce a case, a uh, real life case. Uh, Jack's 42 year old IT specialist in my practice. Jack's not his real name. Uh, he is a rock climber. He has a virtual visit with me recently and he needs a repeat of his meds. And he's asking me whether it's okay for him to get the vaccine because his wife is very worried. Uh, his past health at the age of 32, he had an upper extremity DVT, subclavian. He was treated back then with six months of warfarin. He wasn't investigated and was felt to be due to his climbing as occurred soon after a big climb. Six years later, he suffered a proximal low, lower extremity DVT and a PE, um, and he did fine. He's currently very stable on 20 milligrams of river oxivant. So this is going to be, this part's going to be brief because Ben Bell is going to go into it, but all I wanted to say about this slide is it appears that COVID-19 increases thrombosis risk. It does. And we're going to talk about that in more detail in other talks. The bottom line is there's a lot of risk factors that, that Ben will go into in a little bit more detail. Just being sick in the ICU is itself a major risk factor. And, and we hear about that. And hopefully we can shed a little bit of light on what's going on now in the antithrombotic arena. Common hematological abnormalities, and, and I think for those in primary care, it's interesting. The trend is about a third have low platelets. We hear about the lymphopenia. Uh, lymphopenia is actually more severe in those that are critically ill, but at least three quarters of patients with moderate to severe, uh, with, uh, sorry, with COVID-19 have moderate to severe lymphopenia. 
Uh, fibrinogen really elevated until late in the disease course. So there's a lot of changes also with the D-dimer that we're going to talk about a little bit. For those of us in primary care, we're not typically seeing them acutely because they're being assessed in COVID clinics than in the ER. But these are interesting changes that I thought were apropos for primary care. So let's talk about COVID vaccine information. It is changing hourly. We're hearing a lot and we're going to try and get you all up to date, but I'm going to give you some background. The one amazing thing that we can't lose sight of is the first recognized case uh, was in December of 2019, so over a year ago, and we developed a vaccine so quickly. Nothing in history has been developed so quickly. If you look at MERS, six years, we have no vaccine. Uh, in the SARS epidemic, and many of you may have been intimately involved with that, no vaccine 17 years later, uh, Ebola, no vaccine, and polio took 60 years. Currently in Canada, we have four uh, approved vaccines, two are mRNA, as you know, Pfizer and Moderna. Um, we'll talk a bit about dosing, but Pfizer's approved for two doses, 21 days apart. Moderna, two doses, 28 days apart. And as you know, this target of second shot is rapidly moving. I have been informed that NASI will be issuing a statement in the next week or two about vaccine timing. So we'll hold on for that and see what they have to say. Uh, Pfizer, as you know, has to be stored at minus 70, which is a problem in most primary care offices. Moderna, interestingly, is minus 20 because most of our freezers are somewhere between minus 14 and minus 21. So in theory, we could use Moderna in primary care. Uh, then we have the University of Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. It's a viral vector vaccine, two doses also, four to 12 weeks apart. And we'll talk about that because we do have data. The nice thing about the AZ vaccine is it can be stored in a regular fridge. And similarly, uh, J&J not being used yet, but has been approved in Canada. Uh, one shot also can be stored in at a regular fridge temperature. Comparing the two vaccine types, I mean, similar, but not similar. So we know Pfizer and Moderna are mRNA. So what they've done is they've created mRNA to make instructions to make the spike protein. Then they package it in this big fatty particle that's injected into the patient. And what happens is it causes the host cells to produce this spike protein for which there will be an immune response so that will create antibodies against it. Hence, that is the immune response we're looking for because if the antibodies to the spike protein, you kill the COVID-19 virus. Similarly, but not so similar for the uh, AstraZeneca and Janssen vaccine, they're using non-replicating viral vectors. And what they're doing is they are encoding the spike two protein, the COVID, the COVID two spike protein into a viral vector. The viral vector adenovirus in, in these cases is injected into the host, also initiates an immune response. Also to note, this is an attenuated virus, so it will not cause illness in the host. So let's look at them individually. First with Pfizer, uh, the trial enrolled 43,000 people over the age of 18. 41% uh, were over the age of 56, up to 85. The efficacy of the vaccine, looking at any symptomatic COVID case, uh, efficacy was 95% seven days after the second dose. 93% effective 14 days after dose one, which is very important. Uh, Israel's been giving us a lot of data because they've immunized the majority of their population with this vaccine. And they, their data initially, and I think this is changing, was 85% uh, after dose one within 15 to 28 days. But the most important thing for all these vaccines is we're looking at 95 to 100% efficacy for, for severe disease, hospitalization, or death. The reason I say 95 to 100 is in all these trials, some of the deaths couldn't be adjudicated if they were COVID caused or not. Uh, likely not. So some are actually reporting 100% efficacy at preventing um, hospitalization or death, but we'll say 95 to 100. 
Side effects, they're all very, very similar. First of all, overall serious events are very, very rare with all these vaccines, including Pfizer. Injection site reactions is the most common one. Some people can get fatigue, headaches, muscle pains, chills. Um, one in seven will develop a fever. Some can get arthralgias. Uh, interesting with the Pfizer one, and it's actually formed policy, uh, Pfizer and Moderna, we've seen that you can get uh, enlarged lymph nodes, especially axillary lymph nodes, and I've seen that reaction. And as a result, we suggest that women do not get a mammogram within four weeks of having uh, COVID vaccination. So that's something to keep in mind. The Moderna vaccine, similarly a very large trial, 30,000 people, a quarter of them were over the age of 65. Efficacy, 94%, 14 days after the second dose. Uh, in patients 65 years of age and older, 86% uh, compared to 94% in all trial participants. Similar overall effectiveness 14 days after dose one. So once again, 14 days after dose one, you're protected and greater than 95% efficacy once again. So you get the vaccine, you are going to be protected from severe disease and death. And I think that's the most important thing to look at. Certainly no one wants to get sick, but most importantly, we wanna keep people out of hospital and certainly wanna prevent death. Side effects are very, very similar. Injection site reactions, fatigue, headache, myalgia, the exact same thing. Swollen lymph nodes reported in the same amount of people, 14%, uh, fever reported in 14%. So these things do happen and we have seen them. The AZ vaccine, which we will focus on a little bit more because there's been a lot of controversy. Uh, two original trials, and I'm going to talk about the third trial in a second because it only came out two days ago. But in the UK trial, there were 7,500 people. In the Brazilian trial, there were 4,000 people. Um, originally, there were some issues because in the UK trial, only 7% were over 65. In the Brazilian trial, only 2% were over 65. So 14 days post-second dose efficacy is 62 to 67%. In these original trials, um, and we're seeing, so as I mentioned, this is the efficacy we're seeing compared to what we saw with Moderna and Pfizer 94, 95. So there was a bit of criticism and we're getting all sorts of patients coming to us and saying, well, no, I don't want the AZ vaccine. We need to talk about that because the most important point is this one, 95 to 100% efficacy for severe disease, uh, which includes hospitalization and death. And this is what we're trying to prevent. So certainly the advice that I'm giving is get the first vaccine you're offered as soon as you can, because the benefits of, provide, of preventing hospitalization and death outweigh any benefit you may get by waiting. Uh, adverse effects, almost identical injection site pain, fatigue, headache, myalgia, um, malaise, chills, arthralgia, nausea. Interestingly, with the viral vector vaccines, we're not seeing as much of the axillary adenopathy uh, and it's not being reported. I'm gonna talk, so there's a few new trials that came out, but this is the trial that was published in Lancet at the beginning of the month, looking on timing of dosing. And it looked at a pool of four randomized trials. This is dosing for the AZ vaccine. And the one thing I want to point out here, this was a, this was an exploratory analysis because in the primary analysis it was a little different, but this looked at cases at different times of vaccination. And the point I want to make is the best efficacy was at 12 weeks or more, 81% efficacy, whereas less than six weeks was 55%. I wonder, and we'll see what NASI's statement is going to be, but I suspect they're going to say that the second dose of AZ should be at 12 weeks or more because it does not make sense to do it. And the way I told you the vaccine was approved from four to 12 weeks for second dose, if it were me, I would want it after 12 weeks, according to this recent Lancet article. So in addition to having the advantage of higher efficacy, it has the advantage of being able to protect a larger percent of the population. So that's the one new article that has come out in the last few weeks. Another new article, hot on the press, but it's had a lot of controversy, and I'll, and I'll talk to you about the controversy in a second. This was published two days ago, 
It's a U.S. population-based study, similar to the U.K. and the Brazilian study I talked about. But this U.S. study showed that the AZ vaccine is 79% efficacious at preventing disease and 100% efficacious against severe critical disease. So that made everybody happy. Um, and it had very similar efficacy in participants uh, over the age of 65. They actually report 80%, so similar. This trial actually looked at 32,000 participants, so we had a large chunk of participants, um, and we had a larger percentage of patients uh, over the age of 65 in this trial, so it made everyone a little happier. The problem is last night, the National Institute of Allergy and Immunology, uh, Dr. Fauci, as we see him often, criticized this press release and saying that it was a little premature and it was only based on data up to February 17th and they didn't report all the data. So we don't know if that's good, bad, better, maybe it's better. And AstraZeneca quickly responded saying that they followed all the rules of the game and they haven't done anything wrong. And there will be a full publication that we'll, we will see soon. So time will tell, but I still find it's very reassuring now that we have another trial with 33,000 people um, where we have 80% efficacy. And what I'm trying to do is reassure my patients because we want people to get vaccinated. We don't want them to be frightened, which is a little bit of a problem with the media. Uh, last night on CBC, CBC reports, Health Canada has said that there's no increased incidence of clots relative to the regular population. But in case you get a clot, it can look like this. And then they listed all the side effects of having a thrombosis. And I could not believe I was listening to this on CBC radio. The last vaccine, uh, J&J, 66% effective in preventing disease. 85% effective at preventing se severe hospitalization um, and 95% effective at preventing death. So similar one shot, so there are benefits. Injection site pain, interesting with the J&J vaccines a little bit less. Uh, the rest of the side effects are very, very similar. So what do I tell Jack? I mean, when he first presented, I wasn't sure. I mean, this was probably two months ago. And then we started getting information that the answer is yes, Jack, you should be vaccinated. So right before Christmas, Thrombosis Canada came out with a statement saying that we encourage patients on anticoagulation to get their vaccine and that, that anticoagulant therapy should not be a barrier to getting vaccinated for the 1 million Canadians on anticoagulants. For patients on warfarin, uh, get your vaccine. Yes, there's a risk of, of bruising. So I am encouraging patients on anticoagulant to apply prolonged pressure, not the typical 30 seconds, maybe pressure for three to five minutes. No need to check INR, no need to stop medication, get vaccinated. S similarly for patients on DOAX, get your vaccine. And similarly, there may be a risk of bruising. So a bit of prolonged pressure, three to five minutes. So the message is get vaccinated, apply pressure for a little longer when, than you normally would. Then at the beginning of March, Thrombosis Canada released a statement with regards to the AV, AZ vaccine. And it said that current evidence does not support a direct link between vaccination and development of blood clots. This was at the beginning of March. And they've said it is the view of TC that based on the available evidence, there is no link between receiving this vaccine and the development of blood clots in general. Vaccines of any types are not associated with the development of blood clots. That's changed a little bit and we're gonna talk about it, but it's still extremely rare. Thrombosis is a very common problem, especially in the elderly. It's therefore likely that some people who receive a vaccine will at some point in the future develop a blood clot for reasons that are not related to vaccines. And I'm gonna show you a number. It's extremely rare. And yes, some of them now may actually be related to vaccine, but we're actually talking about numbers in the order of one in 250,000 to one in 500,000. And I'll talk about that in a second. So once again, March Thrombosis Canada endorses the administration of COVID-19 vaccines in those on anticoagulants, even in those that have had previous blood clots. 
Okay, newest statement, um, March 18th, be because Thrombosis Canada wanted to reassure the public regarding blood clot risk and COVID-19 vaccines. So it is a view of TC that based on all the available evidence, people who receive the AZ vaccine are not at an increased risk of developing blood clots when compared to the general population. That still holds true now on March 24th. So the incidence of clotting is not higher on the AZ vaccine uh, than it is in the general population. And in fact, I'm gonna show you some numbers. It actually may be lower, not that it protects you, but there's certainly not an increased risk. Um, but now there is some evidence that there's an there may be an immune mediated, mediated response in one in 250 to one in 500,000 people, similarly to HIT, but without heparin, that causes VTE and sometimes even a rare VTE called the cerebral sinus venous thrombosis. But we're talking one in a quarter to half a million, extremely rare. Um, I may get one of the experts to comment on that, that in our panel discussion. But we need to look at the comparison because the risk in people who have COVID-19 of clotting is much higher. 5% uh, of those that are hospitalized uh, in one in a hundred, so 1% 1 of those that have COVID-19 and that are not hospitalized. So we strongly recommend that all the following groups receive vaccination, people that have had previous blood clots, people that have a family member who's had a blood clot, people with hereditary clotting disorders, and people who are receiving any kind of anticoagulant. The numbers, putting the numbers in perspective, one in two to one, one out of two per thousand Canadians are affected annually by thrombosis. Those that are hospitalized that develop clots is one in 20. One in a hundred in the community with COVID 19 will develop a clot. And the risk of blood clot from the AZ vaccine is about one in 250,000. We should not be withholding vaccines and specifically not withholding the AV, AZ vaccine. So, in summary, COVID-19 increases thrombosis risk. Patients on anticoagulation should definitely be vaccinated. Four vaccines currently licensed in Canada with differing efficacy, but all efficacious, especially against severe disease and death. Vaccines are very safe with very low incidence of severe side effects. And that is it for me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Haber. That certainly uh, eases my mind that somebody as seen as yourself is giving the same information to their patients as what I've been handing out. I'm on the one hand, very excited that CBC is educating the public on signs and symptoms of VTE. And on the other hand, I do wish they wouldn't bundle it together with vaccine right. information. Um, it looks like Dr. Shivji's already got her slides up. Uh, we are gonna hop into the next presentation here and I'll have a quick introduction as well for Dr. Shivji. Um, Dr. Sama Shivji is a clinical associate professor at the University of Calgary. She recently finished her AFC thrombosis training and master's of education at the University of Ottawa, and she received a fellowship grant through the Thrombosis Canada and BMS Pfizer. She now works as a general hematologist and thrombosis specialist in Calgary. So without further ado, Dr. Shivji. Thanks, Dr. Nicholson. So my talk will be on the duration of therapy for COVID-19 related VTE, as well as talking about some of those prophylaxis considerations in special populations. Uh, and so therefore the objectives is to talk especially about the treatment uh, of COVID-19 VTE. And then we'll be talking more about the high risk outpatient populations where fortunately there isn't that much data. I'll start off with the case uh, to get the discussion going. Uh, and so you're in your office, uh, you see a 35 year old man uh, who's a hotel worker. This particular case is very similar to what I had seen in the fall in Calgary. But when you ask him on history, he was working in March when the pandemic hit with individuals from international flights. He unfortunately had close contact with the customers who tested positive for COVID-19. He himself developed some upper respiratory symptoms and tests positive. After about a couple of weeks, his fevers have recovered, but he does have persistent shortness of breath as well as chest pain, prompting him to go to urgent care. There, he gets a D-dimer test that's positive, CTPE study, which shows bilateral pulmonary embolism. 
He had started on a DOAC uh, from the emergency department at a therapeutic dose, but then six months later in the fall, his family doctor notices that he's still on anticoagulation and then asks you about the duration of therapy. So it is important, um, as Dr. Hayward had mentioned, the rates of clot in patients who have COVID-19 in an ambulatory setting are approximately one in a hundred. And this is from a recent study that looked at um, a New York population in the first wave uh, where they looked at about 10,000 adults and they were able to find that one in a hundred of those who were admitted within 24 hours were actually found to have a clot. Uh, and unfortunately in their population, 0.26% ended up passing away in the first 24 hours. We do have a lot more data from hospitalized population, uh, and we'll go over some of the other rates on the other talks, but in looking at systematic reviews, one of the studies that was near the end of 2020 looked at 42 studies. The overall VTE rate was 21%, and then if you broke it down, PE was approximately 30%, DVT was approximately 20%. Not surprisingly, there are higher rates in the ICU and postmortem uh, populations. A review that was uh, posted in early of this year that looked at 102 studies, many more patients found that the rate of VTE was about 14.7%. And in that study, the rate of PE was 7.8% and DVT was 11.2%. So anytime you have a patient uh, that has a clot, you always have to think about risks and benefits. And in particular, thinking of the risk of bleeding versus the risk of clotting. When it comes to major bleeding, depending on which studies you look at, it could be as high as one to 2%. And major bleeding, of course, being in um, sensitive areas or drop of 20 grams. Uh, and then all bleeding in real life data tends to be about four to 6%. In, contra in contrast, the risk of VTE, if you look at patients who come off of anticoagulation, if they've had an unprovoked clot, there's about a 10% chance of having a recurrent event in the first year. Uh, the risk is always higher a bit upfront, but then we do say 25% approximately five years. In patients who have a provoked blood clot, uh, it's approximately 5% of a chance of having another clot in the first year off of coming anticoag off anticoagulation. Some of the data out there might say that it's perhaps a bit lower, so it all depends on which study you look at. And anytime you have a patient that has a blood clot, it's always important to talk about what their preference is. Do they want to be on a blood thinner? How anxious are they, et cetera? But Generally speaking, whenever there's a transient provoking event, we would treat the clot for three months. The CHEST uh, group in their guidelines did say that COVID-19 would be considered a provoking factor. And so therefore, if a patient has a clot in the context of COVID-19, we tend to treat for three months time. Now, naturally, there are some other considerations. Um, so for example, if there's ongoing immobility, if the patient has cancer, then you might consider a bit longer treatment, but generally it should be three months. So therefore, I mean, you're in your office again, you see your patient, you find out that his symptoms have mostly resolved, he tolerated his DOAC really well, and so you talk to him about stopping his anticoagulation, and he agrees. Uh, of course, if I had seen this patient three months earlier, I probably would have stopped him at that three month mark. The difficulty when it comes to the special population of the COVID long haulers is that we don't quite have good data published on what their rate of VTE may be. Um, and so it's hard to give any specific recommendations about that. Now flipping sides a little bit is looking at the prophylaxis um, situation. So looking at patients who don't have COVID-19, we recognize that in high risk situations, so if you're critically ill, if you're hospitalized, if you've had surgery, um, especially after certain orthopedic surgeries, if you have certain high risk cancers, you would be probably put on some form of anticoagulation to prevent blood clots. When it comes to medical ambulatory patients, so people who are at home um, but have other health conditions, it is less accepted to put them on prophylaxis. And then of course, what 
for other situations like pregnancy, et cetera, um, there's individual decision-making based on guidelines. I do want to remind our audience here of some of the other studies that have been done looking at this uh, question. So for example, if a patient was admitted for a medical condition and then gets discharged, do we put them on blood thinners for a month, month and a half? And so we have some of these studies as shown here. The Exclaim study looked at uh, placebo versus anoxaparin injections. And there was of course a reduced risk of clotting, but at the expense of bleeding. Uh, when looking at apixaban versus anoxaparin, fairly similar rates of blood clots, perhaps a bit better rates looking at rivaroxaban or bitrixaban, another 10A inhibitor that's not as commonly used in Canada. Um, but again, you know, concerned about potential for bleeding. And then there's the Mariner study that came out, which isn't showing here, where they looked at rivaroxaban versus placebo. And we really did not find much of a difference in terms of the rate of events. So that is why in general in Canada, we tend not to put patients on any form of blood thinner after they come out of the hospital for medical conditions. Uh, looking at COVID-19 type of patients, it's always interesting to see how many of them may have blood clots after they get discharged. And this study out of the UK is really interesting. They looked at, again, these post-discharge rates, and they found about a 4.8 per 1,000 uh, patient uh, number of, of VTE versus comparing it to the 2019 matched medical patients, it's only about 3.1 per 1,000 patients. Uh, and so although the odds ratio is 1.6, it's still not a very high risk of having a blood clot after having admission for COVID-19. Talking a little bit about the higher risks, for example, the hereditary thrombophilias, which I know everyone wants to know a bit more about. Um, here, as you can tell, the prevalence for most of these thrombophilias tends to be fairly low, and the more common one tends to be the factor five Leiden, sorry, factor five Leiden heterozygous state. If we think of a baseline blood clot risk being about one to two per a thousand per year, then even with a relative risk ratio of three to five, you know, we're talking anywhere from three to 10 per a thousand um, patients per year. So still a fairly low number. And so that's why if patients get diagnosed with factor V Leiden, but have never had a blood clot before, we don't tend to put them on blood thinners. Just to remind us, the rate for having clots in the context of COVID-19 is approximately one in a thousand. Um, and of course, we recognize that the risk of clot is higher if you've had a previous clot, if you have some of these hereditary thrombophilias, and especially for things like antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. But you would imagine that if you had really bad antiphospholipid antibody syndrome um, with recurrent clots or, you know, bad clot, you may already be on a blood thinner. The difficulty in our case is that we don't have very good data on what to do for prophylaxis if you're high risk, any of the aforementioned conditions, and you have COVID-19. So therefore, at the moment, we don't specifically recommend prophylaxis for that population. Something that might help us out are these upcoming studies. So the active consortium, uh, they have their outpatient trial. They're looking at 45 days of prophylactic anticoagulation, so apixaban 2.5 versus regular dose of apixaban, 5-BID versus aspirin versus placebo in a middle-aged to older age group. They started last year and they should be finished by uh, fall time this year, so hopefully we can have some more data uh, upcoming. The Apollo trial is generally in a Brazil population, um, and they're looking at community dwelling patients, they're looking at symptomatic COVID. And then again, this is more of a placebo versus a Pixaban 2.5. They might finish at the end of this year. And then asking about the question of post-discharge prophylaxis, there's the COVID prevent study. That's more of a German study looking at rivaroxaban uh, as an inpatient and then followed by rivaroxaban 10 milligrams as a preventative dose. That might finish uh, in May of this year. So perhaps we'll have some data this summer to look at. 
the same consortium is doing the their covalescence trial, their post-hospital prophylaxis trial, looking at pixaban versus placebo, and again, should be finished at the end of September. And the Michelle trial out of uh, Brazil is looking just at rivaroxaban 10 milligrams, uh, and that will finish at the end of June. So again, perhaps later in the summertime, we might have better data to work with and can hopefully update our presentation as a result. So as it stands now, uh, of course, things can change. We treat our COVID-19 related thrombosis as you would with any other provoked clots, um, individual decision-making for any of the high-risk special situations, Currently, there's no role for the use of thromboprophylaxis in our outpatient population, even if you're high risk outside, of course, of studies. And that also does mean that patients with concurrent thrombophilia prior VTE events, that applies. But perhaps with some of the studies coming out, some of them are, you know, populations of 7,000 patients, maybe we might have some of that granular information to work with. So thank you. Thanks very much, Dr. Shivji. It looks like Dr. Bell has already got his slides up. Last but certainly not least, uh, Dr. Bell is our final speaker for this evening. Dr. Bell is a specialist in general internal medicine with an appointment at North York General Hospital, and he's also a lecturer at the Department of Medicine at the University of Toronto. Dr. Bell is passionate about physician advocacy and patient safety, as evidenced by his part as the Vice President of the North York General Medical Staff Association and as a member of the Medical Quality Committee. He also serves as the General Internal Medicine Section Chair at the OMA and is an active member at Thrombosis Canada. It's through that role that he's been involved with developing online knowledge translation tools, guides, algorithms, and more to help pro healthcare providers with point of care decision aids. He got his MD from the University of Toronto where he also pursued his residency and fellowship. Uh, and Dr. Bell, please take it away. Well, thanks very much for the kind introduction, and I'd also like to thank the co-chairs for the invitation to participate in, uh, in, in tonight's discussion. I was tasked with discussing uh, COVID-19 and thrombosis, particularly in the long-term care population. Uh, this is, I think, both an outpatient and an inpatient talk, because as, as I think we know, uh, uh, for those of us who practice inpatient medicine and for those of us who practice in long-term care homes, the acuity of care, I think, has kind of shifted down. So patients that would um, ordinarily be fully community dwelling and uh, being managed in a long-term care home uh, now perhaps would have been transferred to a hospital in the past. And I think that has, I think that has implications for how uh, patients in long-term care can be managed. Similarly, patients that I'm seeing on the, on the ward now, I think in days gone by would have been in the, in the intensive care unit. So we'll start off with a case. It's an 87-year-old gentleman who with a severe dementia wheelchair bound and he needs help with all of his activities of daily living. He does have an established uh, do not resuscitate order on his chart, but his, uh, but his uh, wife and power of attorney uh, is quite comfortable with interventions to treat reversible illnesses. And in the context of the COVID uh, pandemic and, and uh, this gentleman's overall status prefers to avoid um, our patient being transferred to the hospital. He uh, comes down, unfortunately, with a febrile respiratory illness. And in this context of COVID swab was of course done and uh, was found to be positive uh, the next day. He becomes oxygen dependent and his oral intake goes down. And I think we would agree that uh, certainly in the past, this, this kind of individual would be transferred to a hospital for management, but in the, but in the COVID uh, pandemic context and in the context of the, the power of attorney's wishes, uh, he's not being transferred to a hospital. Um, so the question becomes then what is the optimal therapy for this individual? So I'm going to quickly review the standard of care, uh, pharmacologically at least, um, uh, for COVID-19 in patients on the general medical ward. Uh, this includes dexamethasone for a select group of patients, remdesivir for a select group of patients, tocilizumab for a select group of patients, and VTE prophylaxis, in fact, for almost all. What's the data for dexamethasone? Well, it prevents death. This is, uh, um, there, there have been multiple trials that demonstrate it. This uh, uh, is the data from the largest trial, the recovery trial. This was a New England Journal publication earlier 
this year. Uh, and as you can see for all patients, uh, there was a significant reduction in mortality. That association was lost when oxygen uh, was used and it was strongest in the patients uh, uh, who were in the intensive care unit on the mechanical ventilation. So for dexamethasone, there's mortality benefit in ICU patients. Uh, there's let, there are fewer days on the ventilator. There's mortality benefit for ward patients with prevention of escalation of care to a ventilator. There's no benefit for patients who are, are not on oxygen. The overall number needed to treat in the entire population was 35 to prevent a single death. It's dosed at six milligrams a day for 10 days uh, or until discharge. And the cost is $6.60 orally uh, for, for a course or $91 uh, for an IV course. Remdesivir. So this is, a, this is interesting, I think, remdesivir. Um, uh, this was a meta-analysis done of all the largest trials of remdesivir, and I'm highlighting here the stratified total for mortality, and you can see it, there is some reduction in mortality, although the line of unity, although the 95% uh, confidence interval crosses the, the line of unity. The data was strongest for those who were uh, not on a ventilator, uh, and, uh, but again, as you can see, it crossed the line of, uh, of, of unity. What is remdesivir? It's a nucleoside analog, uh, and, and uh, so it prevents viral replication. There's no benefit in the critically unwell, and so we tend not to use it uh, for such patients in the ICU or receiving high flow oxygen. There doesn't appear to be any benefit regarding mortality or, intub or intubation. It may reduce time to recovery, but there's no change in length of stay. There's no significant toxicity. Uh, uh, the overall number needed to treat to prevent a, a single death, although not a significant association, was 143. The dose is 200 milligrams once and 100 milligrams daily for the subsequent four days, and it costs around $3,100 for the five-day course. So overall, uh, a pretty uh, significant, uh, excuse me, a, a, a pretty costly therapy. Tocilizumab um, uh, is another interesting uh, drug. Uh, again, I'm highlighting um, the all participants section of this graph, which demonstrates that there is a significant reduction in mortality for all patients who are given this particular medication. It's used in a select subgroup of patients, notably those uh, who are on dexamethasone because there's worse outcomes if you're not on dexamethasone uh, and typically in patients who are deteriorating despite dexamethasone therapy and often those who are critically unwell using high flow oxygen. We also like to use this medication in patients who have elevated C-reactive proteins and that's because it's an anti-IL-6 antibody and so reduces cytokine storm. Uh, there have been multiple studies with conflicting results, although the largest one that I just uh, 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 showed that's not yet been peer reviewed, showed that there was a significant reduction in death and progression to the need for mechanical ventilation if you weren't already on it. There was a reduction in the need for dialysis and the overall number needed to treat was 25 to prevent a single death. It's only given IV as a single dose of, eight, of approximately eight milligrams per kilogram and it costs around $1,000. So those are the COVID specific therapies that, uh, that, that we're using. I think that anticoagulation, at least prophylactic anticoagulation uh, is being regarded um, as not only standard care for all medical inpatients, uh, but also perhaps as well as a COVID specific therapy. This is the uh, a slide set, or excuse me, a, a capture from the American Society of Hematology 2018 guidelines on DVT prophylaxis for medical inpatients. And so the, the, the American Society of Hematology recommended for all acutely ill medical patients should receive DVT prophylaxis, typically in the form of low molecular weight heparin. That was on the basis of reduction in the amount of pulmonary embolism and DVT, but at the cost of an increase in the, uh, in the rate of major bleeding, with about 50% more major bleeding. But the question that I was asked to field tonight is, well, what about the long-term care patient who is still dwelling in the community with COVID-19? We really don't have a lot of data on this, unfortunately. Uh, the American Society of Hematology in their guideline statement does touch on um, uh, their recommendations for community dwellers in long-term care who are chronically unwell, and they actually suggest against using VT prophylaxis in such patients. But they do indicate that if the patient status changes to acute, other recommendations, 
would apply. And I believe what they're referring to there would be the med, would be the recommendations for the for the acutely ill medical patients where DVT prophylaxis is indicated. There's no reason to believe that COVID-19 inpatients shouldn't receive thromboprophylaxis. And in fact, as we all know, as the data has already been shown tonight, COVID-19 appears to be a hypercoagulable state with significant uh, excess thrombosis, particularly in hospitalized patients. The risk of thrombosis appears to be less than what was originally reported in the literature with rates as high as 25% uh, uh, or more at the start of the pandemic. And this is likely due to a regression to the mean owing to more rigorous observational trials with standardized methods, larger uh, ends, uh, sorry, a larger number of patients, and of course, more routine use of DBT prophylaxis in these patients. Uh, you know, the true rate of a clinical finding is probably lower when it's studied systematically. I don't say this, though, to cast doubt on the hypercoagulability associated with COVID-19, and there's absolutely no doubt that COVID-19 is associated with excess uh, venous thromboembolism, even when compared with other similar illnesses like community-acquired pneumonia or influenza pneumonia. But the excess VTE risk is probably in the range of two to three times greater uh, than the previously rec uh, 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 reported 10 times. The rate of uh, VTE in the COVID-19 uh, long-term care population isn't studied, but I wanna highlight that age is an important risk factor for the genesis of COVID-19 venous thromboembolism. Outpatient VTE in, in, in COVID patients is probably around one in 100, as we've already discussed uh, uh, this evening. So the reasons for excess thrombosis in COVID-19 is, is, an, is an area of active research. I don't think the nitty gritty of this slide uh, matters so much as just to say that it's probably related to a variety of factors in, including hypoxia, pro-inflammatory milieu, complemented activation, netosis, um, uh, uh, but ultimately at the bedside of our patient, uh, uh, at the bedside of the patients in long-term care on oxygen uh, with COVID-19, the question becomes is how do we, how do we intervene? Has, so prophylactic anticoagulation uh, in COVID-19 uh, inpatients has been an area of massive study and of course debate. You know, in the absence of a contraindication, all major society guidelines recommend VT prophylaxis for all patients who are admitted to hospital with COVID-19. This is a recent cohort study of around 4,000 COVID-19 patients who were admitted to a large hospital system in the United States that demonstrated early initiation of uh, a VTE prophylaxis within 24 hours of admission to hospital was associated with a significant reduction in death at 30 days. The absolute risk reduction for, for death was around 4% with a number needed to treat of 23. And that's a number that I think is similar to the numbers for, for example, dexamethasone and tocilizumab. This relationship between the reduction in death for the early uh, start of prophylactic anticoagulation persisted even after correction for clinical vari variables and severity of COVID illness. Um, uh, the risk of major bleeding requiring transfusion was similar. And there appeared to be less progression to, to, uh, to severe COVID when prophylaxis was initiated early. Of course, uh, this was an observational cohort study with the inherent uh, bias. Why were the patients who weren't given VT prophylaxis up front? Sorry, why weren't these patients given VT prophylaxis up front? Was there a difference between the patient groups that wasn't addressed in the uh, in the clinic? Sorry, in the uh, statistical corrections that were done. I'm only going to speak to this slide very uh, briefly. Uh, because it would really be remiss of me not to mention the results of the multi-platform randomized control trial of attack remap cap and active 4A. This trial randomized inpatients with both moderate and severe COVID to either receive uh, therapeutic prophylactic anticoagulation, so a full strength anticoagulation for the prevention of venous thromboembolism or a usual prophylactic dose of an anticoagulant. I'm going, to, I'm going to focus on the moderate side of this because that's really the, the, the group of patients that we would be looking at who would be in a, in a nursing home. 
And it was found that if you received therapeutic anticoagulation instead of usual care venous thromboprophylaxis, there was a 2% absolute risk reduction in mortality with a number needed to treat of 50 to prevent one death. Now, I think it, I, this, it must, must, must be highlighted that there were few patients who were over the age of 80 in this trial. The average age of the patients in this trial were 60 to 69. Major bleeding, even in this group, was more common in the, in the patients randomized with therapeutic anticoagulation, but still less than 2%. Uh, and so, you know, in the absence of, of this being studied in a long-term care population where bleeding risk is no doubt higher, uh, I don't think that any, anyone would be recommending therapeutic anticoagulation, at least not at this point. So when making a decision regarding whether the patient in front of you should be on a prophylactic dose of an anticoagulant in, in long-term care, I think you need to undertake a risk, a risk assessment and make an individualized decision, I think in concert with the, with the decision makers. You gotta weigh the risks of prophylactic anticoagulation in this context, which would, inc which would include bleeding, the discomfort of a subcutaneous injection, the financial burden associated with it, and of course, the overall lack of evidence. This is not specifically studied in this particular group of patients for which I don't think the risks should be minimized. They're, they're elderly, they have lots of comorbid illness, uh, but you, you also have to consider the benefits being number one, the prevention of venous thromboembolism, which is, which, which is the case in, in hospitalized patients who receive prophylactic anticoagulation. But I think also perhaps the pleiotrophic effects of the low molecular weight heparin and consideration of progression of, uh, excuse me, and, and prevention of, prove of progressive COVID illness. If it's to be undertaken, uh, this is how it is dosed. I'm not going to speak to the specifics here, but this is taken directly from the Thrombosis Canada guide on uh, prophylaxis for medical inpatients. So you can go to the Thrombosis Canada website and see this or look at this presentation online afterwards. The cost is not exorbitant. It's around $10 to $20 per day. And coverage actually exists in some provinces. So I, so I, so I believe Alberta is actually paying for prophylactic anticoagulation for patients in long-term care with COVID. So, oh, and, and excuse me, I also wanted, uh, I also wanted to mention uh, duration of therapy if it, if it is to be, if it is to be undertaken. It should probably be, if it is given at all, it should only be given for the duration of time that you as a treating physician feel that that patient would be admitted anyways. So when the patient is better, when the patient is off of oxygen, I think it's time to stop it. So what's the bottom line? The treatment must be individualized and in keeping with the established goals of care for the patient in front of you. You need to have a discussion specifically with, the, with, with stakeholders and decide. I think the DVT prophylaxis can be considered in a patient with COVID-19 being treated in a long-term care home if this patient would be ordinarily transferred to a hospital to manage their illness anyways. For example, a combination of oxygen dependence, poor oral intake or otherwise failing to cope at the long-term care facility, and if the bleeding risk is felt to be acceptable in this particular individual. I want to highlight that the evidence is lacking in this population and the risks of bleeding and thrombosis are really not well established. And I also want to highlight that, you know, this is a population who, have, who has higher rates of atrial fibrillation. And so you should ensure that the patient is not already on anticoagulation for any other reason. And with that, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. So once again, uh, thanks all the way through. Some really great presentations, a great review for me being a hematologist and not treating a lot of patients actively with uh, TOSI or remdesivir in the ICU at this point. What I do want to do at this point is acknowledge all the great questions that you guys have already been sending in. You can still use the chat function at the bottom to send in some additional questions. And I'm going to invite Dr. Castellucci to pose your questions that you've asked so far uh, to our panelists. So thanks very much. Thank you, Matt. Um, and thank you to our speakers. These were great presentations, very much appreciated. We have had several questions come in um, and I'll get to those in a moment. Before um, I forget to mention this, I wanna let our participants know that um, the Thrombosis Canada website does have um, a link to a frequently asked question document, which um, contains 
uh, information about several of the questions that um, will be answered this evening, as well as um, several of the um, topics discussed this evening by the presenters. Um, so please go to the Thrombosis Canada website um, for some of that information. There is a downloadable um, PDF that you can use and, and distribute and disseminate. Um, and it's also available through the um, COVID information page on the website as well. So thank you for that. Um, so one of our, um, our uh, Thrombosis Canada faculty, um, Dr. Alan Bell, had a, a great question regarding the efficacy or any known information um, regarding the various uh, COVID vaccines and um, their efficacy against the variants of the virus. And I'll ask uh, Dr. Habert to address that question, please. <laughs> Alan, thank you very much. I had a feeling that would come up from somebody, actually, I would have guessed maybe you. It's a great question. So I've done reading over the last three days and a few things have come up. The Moderna and Pfizer vaccines were tested before the variants came out, but at the end of February, they committed to doing studies to look at it. And they are seeing some positive neutralizing benefit with the UK variant. So the two main variants, the UK variant and the South African variant seem to be very different. So we will get more data, preliminary data saying that we are getting some neutralizing antibodies in patients that have been vaccinated, albeit not as well as those without the variant against the UK variant, but not so well against the South African variant. Also, there was an article published in New England Journal of Medicine a few months ago saying that the AZ vaccine failed in efficacy against the South African variant. But in BMJ in February, the Novavax, which is the AZ vaccine, showed pretty significant evidence against the variant. It showed about 85% efficacy towards the UK variant and 60% efficacy versus the South African evidence, uh, uh, variant, despite what New England Journal had to say. So going forward, the studies are being done. As I mentioned, Moderna and Pfizer uh, started their trials in November. There was a, there's a recent very small trial that was started in Montreal looking at a very small number of vaccinated part healthcare workers looking at the variants. And they're starting to get some preliminary evidence, which they say may be positive. But what it appears though, from all the reading is the South African variant is certainly much more difficult to neutralize than the UK variant. And we're gonna to need to be looking at multivalent vaccines and trials are already, phase one trials are already underway against uh, these variants. Specifically, there is one ongoing now with the South African variant. So I don't know if anyone else can shed any more light on this. It seems to be confusing but bottom line is they're certainly not as good and the South African one seems to be worse. Thank you for that, Jeff. And I've read very similar information. So um, again, um, some, uh, some ongoing studies looking at efficacy against the different uh, variants and the South African one um, seeming to be the most concerning. Um, fortunately, in, in Canada, we have not seen quite as much of that uh, variant in our population, more so the, uh, the UK variant. Um, so again, we will update our information um, on Thrombosis Canada as it becomes available. Alan um, made one point that's a great point about the Brazilian variant. I have to say, I've read a ton in the last few days. And, and I would agree, Alan, your concern is probably shared because I'm not seeing a lot of work out there on the Brazilian variant. So if anyone knows different, that is one of the variants out there. And most of the data I'm reading is on the UK and the South African variant. So I, I'm sure that work is being done, but it's certainly not as, as publicized as the other two variants. Absolutely, thank you for that, Jeff. Um, next, I'm gonna move to um, Dr. Shivji and I'm gonna ask, uh, uh, there's been a few questions from our participants um, related to the uh, topic that you spoke about. Um, one with respect to, um, for, for a, a person who does develop um, thrombosis in the setting of COVID-19, but is not hospitalized, 
Um, and uh, the, the example given is that this person um, at the time of their VTE diagnosis um, was not symptomatic from COVID, but was subsequently diagnosed from COVID. Would you still consider that a provoked event? And what duration of treatment would you use? Um, and if you considered it provoked, would you consider it a minor risk factor because they didn't require hospitalization compared to somebody who is hospitalized? That's a very good question. Um, I think anytime you have a patient that has VTE and COVID in close succession, you always have to think about um, if you're calling COVID-19 a provoking factor, when would they have maybe contracted it? And so if it's really far out, then it might be a little bit less clear um, to know its role. Uh, I know I had a patient that was similar where they didn't actually get COVID testing, but they had at least the classic symptoms and then had the clot and we weren't sure. And so perhaps if um, it, it, it all depends on when the timing might be, uh, if it's a few days and it sounds like they probably did get contracted or contracted COVID-19 uh, prior to the clot, then perhaps it could very well be uh, a provoked one. Um, and in the cases that we've discussed is that not everybody with COVID-19 related VT wouldn't necessarily end up in the hospital um, being admitted. They might get the diagnosis and be able to be treated as an outpatient. So in that case, if we think that the COVID-19 is in close dissection, then you could treat them as a provoked clot. Um, there's always a little bit of caveats because if they had other provoking events, um, you know, how, how did they actually respond to the, their treatment? So it's, it's a difficult question to answer, um, but close enough succession that I would probably consider it to be provoked in the context of COVID-19. Hopefully that answers the question. Great, thank you for that. Um, and uh, Dr. Bell, I'm gonna turn to you. There was a question regarding um, use of intermediate dose thromboprophylaxis. Um, I believe that's in the hospitalized patient population. So if you could maybe comment on that. Yeah, sure, I'm happy to. You know, um, so first of all, I'll say that guidelines are, 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 are saying that we should be using uh, standard prophylactic doses of anticoagulants right now for all hospitalized patients with COVID-19 uh, uh, that's being in the ward or in the ICU. Um, uh, I think that perhaps what's, 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 what's happening is a little bit different than, what's, than, than what the guidelines are recommending because evidence is evolving and, and coming out so rapidly that even these living guideline statements, I think are having a hard time keeping up. And so uh, I don't think that there's, a, that there's a unified approach. I don't think that using um, uh, prophylactic anticoagulants, at least at this moment, for medical inpatients is the wrong thing to do. And it's certainly it's what the guidelines are recommending right now. I think that in the context of uh, uh, the observations, both at the beginning and through the pandemic, that um, uh, there is a lot of venous thromboembolism within patients despite prophylactic anticoagulation, that that's where the concept of an intermediate dose uh, came up. And so I think in that context, to, to push the dose to an intermediate level is not is absolutely not the wrong thing uh, to do. But uh, I think that 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 we need to now be considering the results of the multi-platform RCT that I touched on really only briefly in my presentation. And, that, and I would encourage whoever asked that question and everybody else to attend uh, the next pres our, our next presentation coming up on April 7th because uh, the primary author of that particular trial will be, will be able to comment uh, on this question. But the preliminary, the very preliminary data that's been presented so far suggests that in the group of patients who are, who are moderately ill with COVID, as in those who are just on uh, nasal prongs, probably not receiving high flow and definitely not in the ICU, uh, do benefit from therapeutic anticoagulation for thromboprophylaxis. Uh, very aggressive uh, uh, stance, but the evidence suggests fewer patients on ventilators, fewer uh, deaths. And so I think we're all eagerly awaiting that, that data, but I think some people have already, some people here have already switched to their practice um, uh, uh, on the basis of the preliminary data. 
Uh, but I think that right now, in the absence of clear, published, peer-reviewed evidence, um, I think anything is probably okay. Prophylactic, intermediate, and whatever, and whatever intermediate means to you, <laughs> which I think is different to a lot of people, uh, or therapeutic, uh, particularly in the, in the patients who are on the ward. I think in, in ICU patients, I would be right now on the basis of that same trial, multi-platform RCT, I would be avoiding therapeutic anticoagulation and either be using uh, prophylactic or, or, or intermediate dosing. I hope that's uh, I hope that's a reasonable answer. Great, thank you for that, Ben. Um, I agree. I think there are different centers that are doing different um, thromboprophylaxis studies for COVID patients. Um, my center was one of the early adopters of therapeutic anticoagulation based on the multi-platform um, early release data, and um, several others have been waiting for. Uh, the full results to be released. So I think it's a, a variable approach and an individual approach that needs to be used. Um, can, I, uh, can I just uh, uh, say, I noticed that um, that, 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 that a certain uh, Professor Eichelboom raised his hand and I wonder if he might have something to add uh, to, to what to has been said. Okay, Dr. Eichelboom. Brilliant. It's amazing what you can do. Thank you all so much for an excellent, once again, excellent, uh, symposium. This is a really valuable service to Canadian physicians and uh, the statements are really most welcome. Have an authoritative group provide such good clinical guidance. So kudos to all of you. Um, just a question about anticoagulation. Uh, we did, I was thankful to be part of a very large group that published a paper in Jack last week. There are something like 70 trials ongoing at the moment of antithrombotic therapy in COVID. And we made the point uh, in that, that paper, and it was also made by Paul Ridke in circulation about a month ago, that in the absence of reliable information, um, we should be cautious about how we adopt new therapies and wherever possible, we should enroll people in clinical trials. So I noticed the comment that, well, anything's reasonable right now, I would, not disagree, except if you can put people in trials, I hope you would encourage that. Just your thoughts would be helpful. Uh, yes, I, I personally agree very strongly with that. Um, so at my center, we were participating in two of the anticoagulation trials um, that were Canadian investigator led. Um, and uh, when the information from the multi-platform RCT became available with the recommendation um, to stop recruitment, um, our group actually had that discussion and, and felt that the information at the time was very compelling. Um, and so we adopted use of therapeutic anticoagulation and um, we no longer recruited patients into um, trials at our center, but there are studies that are ongoing. And I agree that if you have not um, made the decision to adopt um, recommendations from a study um, or that you want to continue enrolling participants, then I think that you should. I don't want to interrupt. I can't hear any of this. Can you all hear this? Oh, don't worry, then it's just me. Okay. I'm sorry. I was just saying that I agree with you that um, if you do have the opportunity to participate uh, in trials, you should encourage uh, patients to enroll. Great. Um, I was going to go back to uh, you, Jeff, regarding um, some of the um, thrombosis complications that you mentioned with cerebral vein thrombosis thrombosis and, uh, and the AstraZeneca vaccine. And one of our um, participants made a, a very good point of um, noting that where we see cerebral vein thrombosis in the non-vaccine world is in um, younger populations, in particular in young women. Um, and we know that uh, in young women, um, that uh, it's also associated with oral contraceptive use as well as with thrombophilia. Um, and if you have any additional information that you can share, I know there's a lot of limited uh, information and this is all very, uh, very much emerging information that we are collecting on the cerebral vein thrombosis that may be um, associated with the AstraZeneca vaccines. I mean, even with the, even with the report that we're seeing today on, and in the last week about etiology, there is no message about doing anything different and there's no message about avoiding vaccination and the, 
clear message is vaccinate your population because the risks of not vaccinating far outweigh the risks of vaccinating. Agreed. So I, I think that is the message that we need to um, continue to relay to colleagues and our patients um, that right now the event rate of cerebral vein thrombosis um, in those who had the AstraZeneca vaccine is quite small um, and actually very similar to the population um, in, the in the general population. So the signal there is, uh, is not compelling as of yet with the information that we have available. So we are recommending that um, people continue to vaccinate eligible um, patients. And um, we are, uh, there is uh, an international consortium for cerebral vein thrombosis that is collecting information on those who were diagnosed with cerebral vein thrombosis um, related to vaccines. Uh, and they are looking at all vaccines, not, uh, not only AstraZeneca. So hopefully that information is available um, and can help give us uh, um, some more um, insight into how to guide our, our patients. Excellent. Um, other questions that we've had here are um, uh, with respect to um, Salma, maybe I'll ask you with, cause you talked about the thrombophilias and um, we've had uh, a couple of participants ask about um, there are certain high risk periods, for example, where they may take prophylaxis um, and should they take prophylaxis uh, in preparation for vaccination? That's a very good question. I think as it stands now, um, it, it, there's probably the two populations. There's the people who are already on anticoagulation, in which case they continue. Then the patients who are probably not on anticoagulation, although there's that signal that we're seeing, um, if the rate of VTE isn't all necessarily that high, um, I, I don't know if we can particularly endorse doing any prophylaxis before the vaccination, as it stands now. Um, we just have to have close clinical vigilance for any type of symptoms. Um, the difficulty, of course, with any anticoagulation is that there's always that risk of bleeding. So it's not a benign uh, treatment on its own. Um, and so with the rates that we're seeing with the COVID-19 vaccinations, combining that with you know, our odds ratio of having recurrent events, I, I think the guidance is still to not give sorry, prophylactic anticoagulation in that context. Yes, I, I would agree. And I think, you know, if, um, if somebody did have specific concerns, I think it would be an individual discussion between patient and physician as to whether or not that would be um, beneficial for them. Um, Jeff, I will go back to you. There's a question here regarding um, the delay between first and second yeah. dose, um, just because you did highlight it for the AstraZeneca. Yeah. And if you have that information for yeah, the I wanna, mRNA. I, I want to clarify. So the, the question, first of all, for AstraZeneca, Delaying, we know beyond 12 weeks is actually better. So there is no increased risk for the anticoagulated patient. It actually may be better. Uh, there was another great question that came out with regards to the mRNA. Data is coming specifically from the Israelis, early data. So we know that early on, we have data, I think with Pfizer from Israel up to 90 days, which is three months. Um, I suspect information is going to come. I don't know what NASI is saying, but we've, we've been told they're going to make a very significant statement in the next week or two. So I imagine part of it will have to do with AZ in 12 weeks, but maybe they'll decrease all vaccines to 12 weeks. I mean, I don't know what they're going to do, but certainly for AZ, there's no increased risk and there's actually benefit. Uh, certainly for Pfizer, we know 90 days is okay. And I think Moderna is looking. So I, I think time will tell and we will get the information, but I actually don't have concern now. And certainly I would wonder, I mean, when I got vaccinated, mine were six weeks apart. And now in retrospect, I'm much happier that I was six weeks than three weeks. And at the time I wasn't so happy, but I have a feeling that's going to be a positive thing. Great. Thanks for that, Jeff. I agree. I think as we get more information um, as, uh, as time elapses about uh, the efficacy of the vaccines, it will certainly change um, our, our practice moving forward. And the availability of the vaccines has necessitated that delay for a lot of reasons. Um, so I think the ability to um, study that from a scientific perspective and, and see that it's not necessarily harmful to delay um, that second dose is, is actually reassuring.
Um, so I would like to um, thank all of our participants again for joining us and thank all of our speakers. Um, I do want to uh, remind you that there is um, a seminar on uh, or a webinar sorry on uh, April 7th and this is um, looking at thrombosis and COVID-19 in the hospitalized population um, so for inpatient management um, and we have uh, a, again uh, a great series of speakers for that so again many thanks to uh, all of our participants and our speakers thank you thank you very much evening. everybody thank you thank you thanks good night